All right, hello everybody, and welcome to this edition of Tennessee Wildcast. I'm Jason Harmon, Doug and Markham. we got Doug Marks around about here. That. That's all right. How about that? Hop on in there. Yeah. Hey, uh, great time of year. Yes. It? Wonderful. Uh, we're going to talk with top each other the whole show. Yeah, How let's about do that. that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, welcome to the show. Going to be great. We're going to be talking about a lot of fish stuff today, aren't we? It's going to be fun. Have you been? I have been a little bit. Okay. And, uh, had some luck. All right. Well, we're taking Tucker. Tucker's next. Yes, we are. Right, about a week or so. I told him about it, and he's pumped. So, all right. So. All right. It's shellcracker time. It's bluegill time. Crappie getting back out in that deeper water. It's time to go try to do a little trolling for them. Yeah. It's going to be a good time to be going. Turkey yeah. season's over. Sorry about that. We'll have some numbers for you here in a week or two. Next week, going to be setting the uh, seasons across Tennessee. That's going to be down in Dayton, Tennessee. Our, a commission meeting. Our commission meeting. It's one of the bigger meetings of the year, and we'll be talking about that let you know what happens? Yeah, and speaking of fish, real quick, back up on that. We've been seeing a lot of pictures on our on our social media. Good things coming in. People are tagging that TN Trophy Room, tagging that TN Wildlife on their photos, and they're seeing them on our tag board. So keep keep coming in and yeah. checking that out. We want to see what you're doing out TN there. TN Oh, that's fun. And keep an eye on that Facebook we got because it's really rolling across the state. If you want to learn about what's going on with your fish and wildlife in the state, the Facebook is a place to go. Our, our website's excellent, too. Mm-hmm. But the Facebook, I'm proud to say, is really rolling well. And we're doing a little tweeting out there, too. Tweeting. Thank Instagram you. is growing. Yep. All yeah, of that uh, stuff. So, so anyway. We're trying some, to figure out ways to talk to everybody more often. There's neat videos out there, too. If you haven't seen it, go out there and check out that hen and that uh, snake fighting in the <laughs> in the front yard there. So it's hey, pretty who, cool. Somebody asked out there who won. Well, uh, the 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 snake got cornered and then the hen ran off. So, so it was a draw. It was a draw. <laughs> All right, you have to see it. It's a pretty cool little video. You just happened to walk outside and I was headed out the door and I thought I'm gonna get some pictures of that turkey running across the yard and he ran or she ran over there and jumped on that snake. It was pretty neat. Yeah, and they danced around yeah. for a while. It's pretty good. I wonder if she would have eaten him if she could uh, have. Big big dinner. Yeah, big dinner. All right, hey, our guest today, David Roddy. David yes. is the hatchery manager. He's a hatchery coordinator statewide, but. I knew David um, many years ago. We were just talking about that before mm-hmm. the show started. Like 30 years ago, we both started at the agency. And David, longtime manager at Springfield Fish Hatchery in uh, Robertson County, Springfield, Tennessee. David, yep. how long were you there? Mm, about 23, 24 years. 23. And, and it also happens to be one of, if not the oldest, warm water hatchery in Tennessee. It is the oldest warm water hatchery built in 1935. 35. And the amazing thing, Roger Bitts is the manager. He replaced you when you came to Nashville. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the amazing thing about that is before you, there were only like two other managers. That's right. So like four managers since 1935. Yeah, it's funny because uh, probably for 20, 25 years, we had the same hatchery managers across the state, cold water and warm water. Mm-hmm. And now we're seeing... A lot of these managers retiring or moving up, and probably in a couple of years we'll have all new hatchery managers that we hadn't seen in five years. So, and then they might be there twenty five. <clears throat> yeah, it's it's a it's a passion. It gets in your blood, and it, it's hard to leave. It, it was difficult for me to leave because during this time of year, the warm water hatcheries are going at full bore, and I was like a caged rabbit. I came to the office and running back and forth, and guys upstairs just going, "There's flash," you know. And, <laughs> I'd go by their office, so it, it's it, it's hard to to get away from it. It, it gets you in your blood. Mm. You you literally live with it, right? Your house is right there beside the twenty four seven. Mm. You know, you sit down for a Titans game, you look out, and there's a, a agitator that's messing up, and you got to go out and fix it. Or um, midnight rain floods. Floods. You got to remove dam boards from the screens and. Uh, uh, harvest is 24 hours a day sometimes. You get a lot of algae in the summer, so it, it is uh, it, it's a big requirement that somebody's there 24 It's a fight against nature every day, isn't it? What, whether it might be crawdads getting in your ponds back before they're the liner days, which mm-hmm. is how they or algae attacking your or all this other things, all these diseases that can get in the water. It's constant. Yeah, it's something just about every day this time of year. So you don't know what's going to be. Well, David, you moved. Uh, how long has it been? You came to Nashville three years ago? Uh, that's correct, yeah. Three years ago, and you became a hatchery statewide coordinator. What does that mean? Uh, I, I oversee the cold water and the warm water hatcheries. Um, I look at my job as is trying to help out these hatchery managers help them do their job better it's all about um, <clears throat> fish production so if they've got a problem i'll get phone calls saying i got this new vegetation 
what can I treat it with? Or uh, if we run into disease, I can do research where they're still out in the hatchery doing what they need to do. So I'm kind of a, a support for them. And um, <clears throat> they need any uh, assistance uh, harvesting, mm -hmm. I can run up there and help with that but I feel like old times when you do that a little bit huh? yeah yeah, yeah. It, it's it's still in my blood so i can i can get out there <laughs> every and, now and then you have yeah, to get, I out, gotta get out there yeah and breathe again mm -hmm. yeah neat uh springfield hatchery let's talk about that just a minute because it was the otis hatchery or is otis hatchery in tennessee what does it mean for it it's a warm water hatchery what does that mean exactly well, it raises just warm water fish. It goes in our reservoirs and our agency lakes, basically. What would they be? What's examples of a warm water fish? Uh, there's We raise 15 species of warm water fish, and it starts out with walleye and sauger, uh, northern largemouth bass, Florida largemouth bass, uh, black nose crappie. We do a black crappie and a black nose mix okay. at some of the hatcheries, and then channel and blue cat. Um, we do some intensive culture with alligator gar, so it's it covers the gambit. Where's alligator gar going? Where are we putting those? They go to West Tennessee. I believe it's um, the Hawassi, not the Hawassi, but the Oban. And, uh, hatching? The Hatchie. The Hatchie, yeah. okay. Now, I knew it was one of those H words yep. myself, and Hawassi was in my head. That's wrong. We were vibing. Anyway, Hatchie, yep. yeah. All right. So uh, that's warm water, and just we'll, we'll get back to Springfield in a minute, but what's cold water? What is that? Basically, we do uh, four cold water species. The, of course, the most common is the rainbow, the lake, the brook, and um, do you do the brown? Do we? And we the don't, brown. Do we do? Do we raise some brown in Tennessee? Just very few at uh, basically Teleco. Any lake trout anymore? Once upon a time, mm -hmm. we stopped. You said lake. Okay, so we do. Where are we putting lake trout? Are they way over east Tennessee? East Tennessee, and and basically Dale Hollow uh, supports our waters pretty strongly, and they pretty much do the lake. Del Hall National Hatchery. National Hatchery. Okay. Yep. All right. So that's the other thing. How many hatcheries in Tennessee? There's, uh, well, there's four agency co water hatcheries, and then okay. we've got two federal hatcheries, Del Hall National and Irwin National. And okay. we also have the Gatlinburg hatchery that just stocks the Gatlinburg city limits of the streams. Okay. And then warm water, we actually got five hatcheries, and then we've got two rearing stations, but for reporting purposes, the Hawassi and the Sugar Creek Ranch stations, we really call them hatcheries, but they they don't have facilities on them. Okay. All right. And so Springfield, when I go to Springfield Hatchery, Jason and I were there a few weeks ago. Good show. Go back and watch mm -hmm. it with Roger. We yep. sat outside and talked to Roger about Springfield specifically. But what we saw looked like ponds. And then we go to somewhere like Flintville, and it looks like a bunch of uh, – it's just long, narrow uh, raceways. Race mm -hmm. Yeah. So – why is that? Why are there ponds for one hatchery like on Springfield and raceways like on Flintville? Well, at the co-water, you're using uh, pretty much groundwater um, that's a constant temperature, and it's a flow-through system. Okay. So what they do, uh, Flintville and Buffalo Springs get eyed eggs. They hatch them inside the building, and at three or four inches, they move them out at the head of the raceway. And as they grow, they move them down the raceway. But it, that flow-through system, it's got a constant water temperature and and the, the DO stays constant until you get to the lower Dissolved section. oxygen. Yeah, the okay. dissolved oxygen. oxygen. Okay. Um, and in the, uh, in the warm water, it's pretty much farm ponds. We are uh, in production for high numbers of small fingerlings where the cold water is producing small numbers of large fish. So uh, we can stock 100,000 striper fry in a pond and hopefully get out, you know, 50% of that. So we can produce more fish in the warm water than we can in the cold water because most of the cold water fish that we stock are, are catchable. The warm water fish are usually an inch and a half, two inch fingerlings, and, you know, <clears throat> they have to grow. need a few years to grow. Okay, so yep. the trout, the trout you're seeing, if you go to somewhere like the Canyon Fork River or any of the tailwaters over in East Tennessee that are so well known, you catch one about that long. Mm -hmm. Probably came out of our hatchery or mm -hmm. Del Hollow National Hatchery. Yep. And the winter stocking program comes out of our hatcheries too, right? And don't, I guess Del, Del Hollow does a little bit. It's mainly out of Flintville, okay. and we actually transport uh, trout to Humboldt so they can do distribution there for West Tennessee. Okay. And these are, you know, stockable size, uh, running 10 to 11 inches. We want mm -hmm. these people to catch them. Um, it's there for the anglers. And, uh, 
as the water temp rises and they'll start stressing and uh, eventually die. But so we want everybody in the winter trout program, the anglers, to catch, you know, all of them that we stock. Okay. Catch your seven a day, mm-hmm. no size limit, take home eat, come back next day. Yeah, it, and Flintwell yeah. puts in uh, a bonus fish. It could be three to five pounds. Yeah. On we got a video so on TDRE TV showing one of them get caught yeah. this mm-hmm. year on the, the Harpeth, I believe. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was yeah. and that's fish. mainly just in the winter trout program. They don't have a whole lot of them, so they just they slip one on a truck as a bonus. It's a golden egg of trout mm-hmm. fishing. The techniques that y'all use in those hatcheries, the ponds versus the raceways, it, are the cold waters on raceways because that's more like the natural environment of those fish, flowing water. You know, like a river system, or is it just yeah, works they better they pretty way? much swim into the flows. Where in in your uh, warm water, they're just going around in a circle, or in they go the to deep water during yeah. the day. At night, they come up around the banks. And a lot of times, we work at night, light checking, see how our stocking numbers did, or we check fingerlings without having to seen a pond. So, are two different two different animals there, and how they react and how they're. We're, not, we're, we're going to talk about the Florida bass here in a minute because that's something that that you've got going. You're excited about. Heard you giving a talk about the other, but but before we get before we get there, what are some of the things that you do have to face in a warm water? What are some of the things that that you fight against every day? You know? well, of course, it's the dissolved oxygen, and you could have three or four days of cloudy weather, no rain, mm-hmm. and uh, dissolved oxygen is produced by the phytoplankton. It's a real small uh, algae. It, keeps our water our ponds really green you get cloudy days with no sun it stops uh producing oxygen and we can have a an oxygen depletion and of course uh these heavy rains that we've had it will actually push the phytoplankton down and, and cause a, a do crash or uh, a lower amount of dissolved oxygen and of course um <clears throat> in the spring with all these heavy rains it'll rot, wash out the nutrients in these uh, warm water hatcheries and then your water clears up and here comes algae vegetation so it's a constant battle of those two main things and then in striper hybrid striped bass productions the heat the heat got to keep what do you do in that if you got a big pond and you get maybe got the small creek coming into it to keep it up what happens that we've creek? got we've got some maintenance water if if our water supply is ah. up but um they'll pretty much get accustomed to the warm water it's just as water temp goes up your dissolve oxygen normally goes down so i notice y'all agitate the water a lot got the Whether paddle wheel aerators paddle we've yeah. got casco uh pond aerators that's electrical so uh it's a constant battle with the environment and, and on that point same with a pond owner out there somebody that's put in this beautiful pond and they've got all these great big bass in there and bluegill and, and catfish maybe crappie if their lake's big enough big mistake is not putting in an aerator in that pond well the, the best thing to do is start fertilizing it in march through october and it's it's very simple it's triple 15 50 pounds per acre and what that does is feed that phytoplankton which produces the oxygen okay and you could put in a pond aerator especially during june july and august when it's really the hottest and that's when your d- dissolved oxygen normally is low just because the water temp side but that that would be helpful but and supplemental if you, but if you're doing what you just said then they could survive that, mm-hmm. that summertime heat and that in those cloudy days yeah and fertilizing also it, like i said it keeps that water green and it, it uh, keeps the vegetation from growing because it uh, it sheds the sunlight from going to the pond bottom most of your algae and your uh, vascular plants come off the bottom okay all right um is there a so i get asked a lot about how many fish we're stocking and so forth is there a place on our website mm-hmm. where they can find that information uh, the warm water stocking, uh, it's a PDF. I not, it's it, out there, though. It's out there. We I, just put it up a couple of days ago. I saw that. Okay, it's got a hatchery truck there, and if you hit that tab, it, it comes up. Uh, Look under four anglers. Yeah, under I'm that. sure under it's anglers, under four yeah, anglers. Fishers, yeah. yeah, okay, four, but it is anglers. out there. So are you updating it as you go, David, as you stock more fish? It's getting in there, and people can see where you're stocking them and, and how many you're putting in. Yeah, Tracy Smith down in, uh, in our uh, – IT department downstairs had just finished uh, working with some online stocking for our hatchery managers, and she was able to build this PDF. So when they go online, enter their stocking date, it automatically goes cool. in this PDF, and then I can just send it downstairs to our web. She's a, yeah, that's awesome. She's a program for our, mm-hmm. programmer for. She does a great job. So it's there. Um, how many fish? And, and I want to talk specifically I mean, about the southern, about the Florida largemouth. But how many fish do we stock? Uh, warm water and cold water every year 
on average? Co-water is usually about 2.2 million. Does that count Del Hollow, working with Del Hollow? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the warm In water uh, is about 6.5 million. 6.5 million. That's a lot of fish. Wow. And I know you put them in his fingerings, David, but do we know for sure if you put in 100,000 stripers on whatever, like Watts Bar, or, well, we'll put, I don't want to put stripers in the lake where they're not, but 100,000 on Percy Priest because there's stripers in there. Do you know how many are going to, how many are going to survive? Do we have an idea at all? I don't, I'm not sure. I hope it'd be, you know, 25%, <laughs> but uh, we have stocked at ramps and seen fish come up and hit them, but um a lot of times, uh, especially the Florida largemouth, they'll school. And there's a, there's a place I used to stock down at um, Dayton Boat Dock that actually had a dock right at their ramp. And after we stocked, they would school and go under that dock. So it's hard to say. It's um, uh, When they're ready to hit the reservoir, they're looking for a bigger food item than we've got in, the, in, right. the, in our warm water hatchery. So you got to let them go. And, and, and I've heard, are there, is there some worry, one of the many enemies you sort of fight in, uh, in a hatchery is also their own cannibalization? If they get so large, will they start turning on each other? Yeah, we call them jumpers, and we see that in the largemouth bass. Um, I've actually seen it in crappie and also in sauger. Jumpers? Yeah, it's just, it could be genetics where one fish just grows faster than another, and they're pacivorous, so they'll feed on each other, so... They'll be looking, once they get up past their food item in the pond, they'll be looking at their brothers and sisters. Uh -oh. and, watch out. Start yeah. eating. So you got that's another reason you got to get them out of there so they don't start eating each other. Interesting stuff. All right. All right. Tell us about largemouth bass. This has been going on now three or four years in Tennessee. Well, it's been going on longer than that. This, this, this pickup that you've done, what you're doing with the hatchery work and bringing more fish in, has been really ramping up in the last few years. But 10 or 12 years ago or so, we started – Stocking Chickamauga, Chickamauga with the help of a fish group, or a fish, uh, a fish club over there. Tell us about that and where have we gone? Where have we gotten to today? Well, uh, I guess the uh, state record fired everybody up. The commission wanted to expand our program, so the fish division picked out five more reservoirs in one uh, agency lake to stock. And uh, pretty much, we didn't have Florida bass brewed, you know, in our facilities so probably for 10 or 12 years we were getting them from texas and the first year uh, that we started getting them from texas uh, we fedexed them in and they showed up two days later and when the guy showed up at springfield Did you have to he, sign for him yeah <laughs> yeah, go ahead, go ahead. yeah yeah really <laughs> when when he showed up at springfield he had the box on end and it was between his, his front seats and i go oh no because they should be laying flat and of course he was late and he handed them to me and you could already smell the the dead fish in it so that, <laughs> that didn't work out good at all i think we all had problems across the state with them so uh we started employing barbara schaefer our pilot to fly to san marcos to pick up our okay. our fry so they boxed them up at seven o'clock we had them back in tennessee at one o'clock and they did great and uh, she she did that probably for about 10 years and then with this new expansion, you know, it, I, I got a little bit scared because it went from 300,000 fry to us needing 1.2 okay. million fry. Well, let's back up. Y'all, you, you know, you're talking about the new expansion, the commission saying we need mm -hmm. to put them in all these – all on the Tennessee River, I think. All, all the, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Um, so, you know, I'm going uh, – you know, Texas is not really willing to give us 1.2 million fry so we've been in this i think this is the third year that we've done that expanding stocking so i uh, made a contact louisiana and, and the hatchery manager sure you know we'll give you eight hundred thousand fry so that made the number but um a couple of times barbara couldn't fly and you know you can see the writing on the wall we need we need a million fry and, and we're already running into issues where she can't fly and, and you're dependent on another state and guess what this year at louisiana they had a drought and they couldn't give us any fry so uh, and the fry this year was just back up to our facility so i knew a couple of years ago we're gonna have to do this ourselves we're gonna have to be more independent so uh two years ago the hatchery started setting back some of our fingerlings that we had raised um, for future brood and um so this year we we actually get the uh, the facility up and running 
Um, okay, let's, start, let's back up on the facility. Where is this facility? Okay, um, it's at uh, Humboldt uh, Hatchery. It's right, right there at Humboldt Lake. Okay, it's the only place we could find had a big enough footprint. And initially, we wanted to use the lake as a water supply, but we went ahead and just built a pond beside the facility. So uh, we can use our to fill up the raceways. We can bring that pond water in, fill them up. Uh, and they can use it as a multi-purpose. They can actually flow through, just like a you know a trout hatchery. But they want to do some experimentation with early catfish spawning, so um, with the water temp. So um, I know I'm bouncing around trying to it's okay. put all this in perspective. Um, so yeah, there was a major need that that we'd have to be sole proprietor or sole per, um, and to raise our own fish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, raise our own fish. Um, so our brood was two years old this year, and we weren't sure if they were going to, you know, for one thing, spawn or produce uh, the fry that we needed. Okay. So this was kind of a dry run. Um, so we were able to get them in the facilities. We are able to um, have LED lighting in there, which is real important. There's no windows in this building. There's only like four doors. And uh, if you go in there at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, the light's off. You're going to get hurt because you can't see. So... One of the ways to make these uh, large mouth spawns is manipulate the light. So when we brought them in, we set the lighting up on 12 hours. We didn't have the mats in there from the spawn on, and we kind of acclimate them for about a week to, to two weeks. And then we just bumped up the lighting to 14 hours, dropped the mats in, they started spawning. Oh, wow. That's so, neat. Yep. You um, created your own time zone or mm-hmm. whatever. Yeah. All yep. right. So all this is kind of research and experimenting on what are they going to do and so we ended up with 80 spawns, which is just phenomenal. And we only had 60 females in, in the building. So, so they, some of them twice or maybe three times. Literature yeah. is saying a female spawned two or three times mm-hmm. um, because they're intermittent spawners. They just don't uh, spawn or lay all their eggs at one time. So um, once, the, once they come in, the staff comes in the morning, they got uh, flashlights, they look for the egg masses, they'll take that mat out, drop a new one in, it's pretty funny because the male will swim off. They'll grab that net. He'll come back. And I was going to, well, you know, what is he thinking? Where did my, my eggs go? But he will come back and guard that and actually go get another female a couple of days later. So we, uh, we put those mats into a trough and then treat them uh, with hydrogen peroxide. It's a very concentrated. It'll actually, you know, turn your skin white uh, for as a, a disinfectant. And then... With our high water temp that we have to maintain, uh, they'll hatch in two days, and in six days we we pull them out and put them in our pond. Wow. The main reason uh, for this building is to manipulate lighting, and also we've got to heat the water. It has to be at 72 degrees for all for all this to happen. Luckily, it's been warm this year, but next year we could have a real cold March, you know, 40 or 50 degrees, and we're going to have to rely on a lot of hot we've got hot water heaters and also uh, uh air heaters in the in the building you walk in it feels like a sauna mm. okay and no no light in there was it's how big a thousand square feet 500 square five thousand feet? square feet five thousand square feet. that's a pretty big building yeah the yeah. raceways are 70 feet long eight feet wide okay and that and that's pretty much it's all it's in there's some uh filtration we need to go yeah, jason and i want to go check that out and do some video and, and it's it it's a stuff. fully recirculating uh, hatchery is the only one in the United States on uh, Florida largemouth recirculating facility. Okay, and we wow. built it. Did we actually build it, the agency? Or yeah, we contracted okay. out uh, some of it. Yeah, but the design was ours. All right, that's awesome, David. So I think I heard you say at a meeting the other day with your counterparts across the state, fishery counterparts across the state, that you had raised five hundred and seventeen thousand this first year with a goal of a million plus. Did I hear that right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I was been surprised we had one spawn, but we actually uh, in a month's time uh, was able to produce five hundred seventeen thousand fry. But we we will need a million one point two million. We're still trying to tweak our ponds. Uh, the first year that that we uh, on this expanded project, uh, we had seventy five percent return. Last year we had about thirty. So we're trying to figure out what these ponds are doing. It's just like we discussed. It's environmental uh, effects. So. We need several years of consistent production, yeah. and we could drop that number, you know, to nine hundred thousand fry. We to stock 
our reservoirs, we need 675,000 fingerlings. Okay. And uh, will you supplement this year or just do the best you can this year and next year do better? Well, actually, um, we, we went to San Marcos two weeks ago and picked up 500,000 fry to supplement because our, our bass were too small. We knew we weren't going to get the numbers. Okay. The so brood fish were too small. Brood fish. Mm-hmm. So uh, we're in uh, uh, brood maintenance now. We're into go fi- uh, go fish spawning and koi spawning uh, to cut cost, and and that Humboldt Hatchery will probably be spawning monthly. Is that to feed them? Is that's that what you're to, saying? Okay, to feed them. Okay. So if we can put body weight on them, um, the literature says four thousand eggs per pound of body weight per female. So if these things grow, we can get them about three or four pounds. That's an in- increase our egg number and our fry. So. Uh, Texas has got some 17-year-old brood that they're still using, Good. and they're running right. five and six pounds. So you don't need too many of those. Did you spend some time in Texas or other places studying, or did you just get literature and study? Or how uh, you I've do? been to uh, I've been to three Florida bass facilities, so it's stealing ideas. Okay, well that's a good way to do it. Yeah, but all this is uh, this research system is all new technology, and um, I was thrilled that it, that it worked. There, uh, what you have to worry with in in the uh, research facility is ammonia and so we were watching that um, because we put we put koi in to inoculate the filtration system so we were watching we got a test kit so bass these florida bass do not like ammonia so we had really had to monitor that i knew everything else would be in check but ammonia was really a concern so it, re- it worked out perfectly so hopefully this will be consistent but uh it's exciting stuff. In in the business now, producing Florida largemouth, and David, I guess that's part of the reason. There's there's two reasons coming to my mind quickly about why they won't be put in some places like the Cumberland River system. One is concern about how well they'll do there and what they might do to uh, our native population since we're, and the other is just plain old hatchery space. You just don't have. You're doing everything you can to get what you got right now. Is that right? We're maxed out. Yeah. Okay, so we are where we're going to be probably for a while on Florida largemouth bass. Yeah, we're doing expansion at Normandy. We'll probably put a pond down there. Like I said, we're trying to evaluate how many ponds we need to get that 675. Mm-hmm. So, we'll, you know, we'll probably have a couple of surplus ponds in. It probably will, be, hopefully, will overproduce, which is, is okay. we got places for them to go within that, uh, that stocking reservoir. But, um, yeah, if all the biologists can get their number per acre they want of all species— I think the golden, the magical number is 10 per acre. Yeah. Right now we're about 3 million short of that. So okay. that's why we're continuing to expand. If they all got what they want, which we call the hatchery state. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's there's be that many hatcheries because the guys out there in the field, they want to get fish for the folks to fish. They want to get them, and it's just hard to get everything. But, David, you are putting in a lot of great fish. It's and amazing what you are doing. Yeah, it really is. It's amazing what they do with the staff they got. And going back to Springfield where we sort of started – there's two folks running Springfield Hatchery, and that's what it was your entire career there, too. Two folks running that entire hatchery that was created in 1935 and needs a lot of work. And every time something broke down, y'all had to fix it. Yeah, and, and I guess you were up there and saw the pond liners. Uh, something happened over the years after they constructed, and these springs started coming up in the in the bottom of the ponds. And when you fill the pond up, the it's a wet weather spring but it's there all the time but when you fill them up the pressure reversed so we were losing water in the pond losing our our nutrients uh and protect productivity went down so we had to, to line them and uh that entire hatchery is done by agency personnel yeah we got out there and lined it up i somehow i, I missed out on that mm-hmm. but i understand it was very difficult to work to there's put a, those ladders there's a lot of people won't talk to me anymore <laughs> <laughs> Davey did great. There's other things that we could talk about. I wanted to get more into the future of hatcheries, but we'll get you back on here and uh, talk to you more. So, great job. Yeah, great work y'all are doing out there. Yeah, yeah they I look are. forward to seeing that Humboldt yeah. uh, facility. That'd be a uh, great Wildcast Extra we can do. Yeah, just let us know, Dave. We're going, okay? Sure thing. Yeah. All right. All right, everybody. Go out on the site. If you'll see what's getting stocked, uh, we'll, we'll put some information out there make it easy for you. Uh, but you can find it on tnwildlife.org and under under four anglers at the top anglers, of the page yes four anglers and in that tnwildlife.org you can find this show and all the past shows you got a lot of great shows out there just like david and go watch them and 
listen to them, whatever you want to do. Yeah. Keep we'll following us on week. social media. Yeah. Free Fishing Day, June 10th. June 10th. Yep. Thank you all.